people remember um, the bad things that you do, but people also remember the good things that you do. And those things might come back to bite you in the arse or they might come back to, to help you. So I think it pays to be a, a good person and Absolutely. be professional. Paying dividends. And it's, it's also good to... I mean, people remember the worst stuff more than the bad stuff sometimes, but if you're not a shit person... And you reflect on that and, you know, you're doing authentic, like genuinely good things. People remember that more, right? Yeah. Welcome to the Sevo Show. Thanks Final. for having me. It's been two ye- uh, more than two years come. I've been trying to get you on for a while. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's been hard to yeah, yeah, align nah, at the same time. Been and... a busy guy. And, uh, yeah, yeah the, uh, for everybody listening at home, Halim, his OG hero story, spawned in Broome. Yep, yep, right. Yep. Broom, then he uh, then he moved down to uh, Perth somewhere along the way with a, a bit of ups and downs, and his passion, photography, creating visual stuff, arts, and uh, yeah. Long story short, he's be- managed to achieve that and become a full time creator, whether it's for himself or working for someone else. He's turned his passion into a profession, and that's really the. The whole essence of the Sevo show is everybody that comes on, we talk about how they've managed to do what they love and get paid for it or get to do what they love. You get to do what you love every day. Now, Absolutely. First met you in the sneaker scene, I believe it was, or back in the days of the Sevs tours, I think, when yep. I did the walkabouts in, uh, in, in the city. And uh, I don't actually remember the first day we met. We just, it just, we just existed together. It was great. I, th- I think I do. Uh, I'm not sure if this was the, the first time, but it was uh, at the Foot Locker on Hay Street back when they used to host the live raffles. Oh, that, those were the and, times. And um, if I remember correctly, I was wearing a New York Knicks hat and you're a Knicks supporter. And, and Chicago uh, Bulls, but close enough. <laughs> Same atmosphere. So, yeah, I, yeah, the sneaker stuff I remember very, very well, especially going through all the sneaker lands and discussing shoes and seeing you pop up there and then starting to uh, – my, my favourite memories are seeing you at the games, the NBL games at the Wildcats, you doing your thing and then and then I'm in the crowd texting you and messaging you like, I can see you and then you'd find me and then that day that I was on the court as well filming shit for the NBL with my phone and doing some interviews and shit and you were there like, fuck, yeah, we're here, we're here. That was a moment. Um, but yes. then – it's been really cool to, yeah. um, you know, being on my own journey but seeing your, your own journey and, yeah. you know, other people that I met throughout the sneaker community. I guess the sneaker community was so uh, – such a cool place to meet people back then who were into the same sorts of things but different things as well. But then to find out our, our paths aligning again, mm. you know, at different events where I, where yeah. I see you is, is lots of fun. So good, so good. So then what happened uh, – well, let's go back. Let's go back to your hero story. You, you were born in Broome. Um, how early, how old were you when you realised, yeah, fuck, photography's sick? Um, I think it stems from when I was really young, I was into BMX and skateboarding. This was before the internet and uh, to get any new information, you'd have to go and look through magazines mm. or buy VHS tapes. And um, I think I was really attracted to the imagery in, in skateboarding and BMX magazines. Yeah. And we would try and, I guess, recreate that kind of stuff with disposable cameras and um, I didn't realise at the time that uh, what I was pursuing was my my passion in photography, um, but I guess I was. Yeah, yeah. So then what happened next? What's the move down to Perth like and what does that feel like in terms of moving out of the nest? Because how old are you now? Uh, I am 34 years old. Nice. Um, yeah, moved to Perth when I was 15, sort of had to... Broom's really small and, and tight-knit and I kind of know everyone mm-hmm. and had to make some new connections here. Um, but, yeah, made a lot of cool connections in Perth. Um, still managed to pursue photography by being attracted to the music scene. Mm-hmm. Um, anytime I was at a live gig, I would try and sneak my camera in if I could um, or if I had friends that were performing, I would you know, bring my camera to their events and really enjoyed playing with the lighting and, and smoke and atmosphere of, of that kind of photography. So all I'm hearing at the moment is that camera was attached to your hip at all times. Yeah, def- definitely. Um, even I would 
take it to parties and stuff as well. I guess um, at one stage I was a bit of a party photographer. Yeah. Um, and I really enjoyed being able to look at photos that maybe I don't remember taking. Um, and, yeah, I think everyone enjoys that experience after yeah. a big night, being, up, being able to remember things. That, yeah, the hangover thing. You look at the camera once, you're like, never again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much like the movie, The Hangover. So you had the camera on you. You weren't bouncing it around like a footy, but you were snapping it like anything. Um, with your connections, when you discovered – how do you make these connections when you're in a new place? There's a lot of creators out there who are mostly introverted – but if they want to become creators full time, they have to get out there and talk to people. What's your pro tip? Um, it's it's funny because I am quite an introverted person. I I, I think most of the time, um, you know, I made some connections at at high school, um, but then also going to live music gigs is where I um, met a lot of other people who were into the music scene um, and. Coming from Broome and then moving to Perth, like Broome is a really small place, but Perth is a really small place as well. Um, and I think I knew from a really young age that um, the, the value of being professional and nice to everyone that you meet, because you never know when those connections might help you in the future. Um, people will remember um, the bad things that you do, but people also remember the good things that you do. and those things might come back to bite you in the ass or they might come back to, to help you. So I think it pays to be a, a good person and Absolutely. be professional. Paying dividends. And it's it's also good to – I mean, people remember the worst stuff more than the bad stuff sometimes. But if you're not a shit person and you reflect on that and, you know, you're doing authentic, like genuinely good things, people remember that more, right? Yeah. So um, – Okay, so you're you, making your connections in the mu music scene and then getting into the next part. So you're now in your early 20s. This is at that time, by the way. What are you doing for cash at the moment, at that moment? What are you doing to make money? Um, I was working from 2011 to 2018 at the Apple Store uh, in the city. I think I bumped into the, you there a, a few times. Um, so I guess that was my, my stable job for a good good eight years. Um, and I so, sort of did that as long as I could. Um, and I knew it wasn't fulfilling me. It, it wasn't um, what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, so I moved to the car sales industry um, and started selling cars for Mercedes-Benz for a little while. Um, and sort of realised that that wasn't for me as well. Um, How old were you then? Uh, I was... Would have been in my late 20s. Yeah. Yeah, late 20s. What, um, made, you, what made you think, okay, it's not for me? What, what was the defining moment? You're like, nah, this ain't it. Um, it was, I think it was just something that I knew deep down, um, especially those long hours it, uh, doing car sales, 12-hour days, you had a lot of time to think about things and think about, do I really want to be doing this for the rest of my life? I knew it wasn't, my passion wasn't being fulfilled. And funnily enough, the, um, some of the best times of my day was when the photographer would come and take photos of our car and I would, I would chat with him and... Um, what settings are you using or what's the go? Yeah, yeah, yeah I was that annoying guy. Yeah, because, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, you know, I love photography so much. But I also knew that um, photography can be a, a hard industry to throw yourself into completely um, because there's, you know, a lot of people out there take photos um, and you do, I think you do really have to develop your style, develop your personality, um, which, which takes a long time. Um, and I think it was about a good 10 years or so of, of doing photography before I was able to consider myself an artist, I think, um, because I had developed my own style by then. Um, yeah. Nice, nice. And once you've developed your personal brand as well, uh, what was your like – so talking talk, – let's go back to the Mercedes gig. 
What did you do next after that? Um, I ended up working for, stayed in the car industry, but working for Tesla yep. for a while in their service department. Cool. Um, so, you know, when people had problems with their Teslas, they would uh, report it through the app and I would try and, you know, solve it. And if I couldn't solve it, then they would come in and book a service. And yeah. Yeah. But at, yeah, at the same time, also that, I knew that that wasn't fulfilling me as well. And while I was doing that full time, I was also starting to pick up a lot more photography jobs. So I was pretty much working to full-time jobs. Like there was a, a couple of years there where I don't feel like I had a, a single, what you would call day off um, because I was either working for Tesla or I was starting to pick up a, a lot more freelance photography and, and that's where I knew that that's where my, my passion was. All right. This is where we're getting into the juicy stuff now. So you're creating a like a, a overlap now with your Tesla job and your passion turn, you know, profession. Um, tell me about your first gig that you got, your, your first kind of photography job. When did you get that? Um, my first photography job, I guess I used to do a lot of like events yep. and stuff, um, which is very basic, you know, take – social photos of people standing there with the flash, um, similar to my party style photography. Um, but it, it was a while before I realized that sports photography was my passion and that's really what I wanted to pursue. Mm. And I think it was, um, yeah, w once I started doing that, that I knew that that's the career path that I wanted to be in for the rest of my life. Um, and my first, I guess, really big gig was when they hosted the AFL Grand Final in in Perth. That was your first big gig. What a first big gig to have as a per first big gig. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, um, it was. Yeah. It was. It was a surreal, surreal moment. Um, it was all very last minute because of COVID, and I heard that there were rumours that the AFL grand final might be hosted in Perth. And so a part of me knew that a lot of things will have to be organised last minute. And I also knew that there were like travel restrictions in place. Um, and I knew that it, it was possible for me to be able to get in there and, and photograph her. I didn't know how, but I, I knew that there was a possibility there. So I, it was maybe a month before the grand final actually happened where I set the goal for myself that I want to shoot the AFL grand final. And then what did you do next to implement and make that a reality? I kind of just put some feelers out into the universe. So you got to do it. Got the feelers. Jumped on Facebook. You know, does anyone know anyone who knows anyone? Um, I, I knew someone in my network might know someone, but that was kind of like a, a, a long shot because, you know, someone has to read your post and then be like, you know, and then hassle someone else. And um, it ended up being a post that I'd put on Reddit, on the AFL uh, subreddit, on the thread that was talking about the AFL grand final being held in Perth. Um, I just, yeah, said that I was a keen photographer and does anyone know anyone who can, who can get me there? Far out. So you got your first... AFL Grand Final photography job from a Reddit post. Yeah, from a, a comment on a... There's the fucking hook at the Reddit start of the show right there. Holy shit. Okay. So what happened next? Eh? How, how did that unfold? So I ended up getting a message uh, from someone on Reddit who said that they worked for a media organisation and that they might be able to help me out and would I be willing to have a have a phone call? So, of course, jumped on that phone call. What um, did that feel like? Were you, like, shitting yourself a little bit or were you like, oh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was kind of shaking. I felt it was a little bit too good to be true. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, followed through with the phone call. So the uh, person told me that he was the sports editor for a newspaper Indi national indigenous newspaper called the Koori Mail newspaper. Um, and I said, I, of course, know of the Koori Mail newspaper. I told him that I'm a, a, a proud Jaru man, indigenous man uh, from Broome. And 
Aboriginal people being Aboriginal people. He knew some people in Broome, told him my last name. He actually knew my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> and so this, yeah, phone call started out, you know, quite funny. We started talking about our family connections before we started talking anything about photography or... That's so important though. Yes, yeah. That is like, you have that, you pretty much got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, and then it yeah, eventually got to the point where he, he, he was told me that they needed someone to take photos there. They weren't able to send a photographer because of the COVID restrictions. So he was going to apply on my behalf for AFL accreditation. And I was like, yeah, awesome. And then it got to the end of the phone call and he was like, oh, wait, you can take photos, can't you? <laughs> And I was like, yeah, like, I'm, I'm pretty good. Um, didn't tell him that I'd never covered an AFL game before, um, but I hadn't. But it turned out that that weekend coming up, I'd had the opportunity to cover a, a waffle game, which would have been my first AFL game. So I told him that in a week I could give him an example of my images. Um, and of some of my work that I'll, I'll, I'll deliver to him that yeah. I haven't taken yet <laughs> yes that's fucking sick man and um funnily enough like um i knew i always knew that i could take incredible sports photos because i'd you know looking at bmx magazines looking at skateboarding magazines and being attracted to imagery i knew what made a powerful image yeah uh, and i'd been taking photos for 10 years i knew how to take photos and i knew that I could deliver on this thing that I'd never tried doing before. But I remember getting to the Leaderville Oval to photograph my first AFL game and thinking to myself, why the fuck did I think that I can do this? Like they are so far away and at any moment the ball can be 50 metres one side, 50 metres the other side. I was kind of just like running around the field with my camera. <laughs> we didn't have a long enough lens and I was just trying to get close enough to the action to take photos. But luckily enough I was able to put an, a good enough portfolio together to um, yeah. Yeah, to, to get that opportunity. The universe was on your side. Nice. And then, uh, yeah, tell me about leading up to the day, the grand final. Melbourne and who was it? Who, who they verse? The losers? Uh, Western Bulldogs. That's right. Western Bulldogs. 2021? 2021. 2021. AFL grand yeah. final. So, yeah, how, how, how do you prepare for something like that? Um, <laughs> how did you prepare for something like that? First of all, I had to hire myself a big lens <laughs> because I didn't have the right... Who did you use? ...lens for the job. I uh, went to... Camera house. Okay. Uh, Not the right one, but did no, the job. What, well, no, what's the one? Camera electronic? Yeah, yeah camera yes. electronic. Yes. Shout yes. out to the boys, camera Shout electronic. Shout out, camera electronic. Solon Howard coming in clutch for the My Guy. Uh, yeah, they... They sponsored this. They let me borrow <laughs> the 600. Yes. Uh, lens. Very did, big lens. Did they charge you for it? Uh, yes, they did charge me for it. Yeah. Uh, hopefully next time... Next time there won't be. Solon Howard, you know, you know. You know. Um, and I remember having the the thought too when I was sitting um, at the at the grand final with this 600 millimeter lens, which I'd never used before in my life, and once again having the thought, why the fuck did I think <laughs> I could do this? Um, but I'm I'm happy with with what I was able to deliver. Uh, but sorry, back to your question about preparation. Yeah, I guess there's the yeah the the physical preparation of getting your gear ready. But then there's also the mental preparation, um, preparing myself for something that I'd never done before, an environment I'd n never been in before. Um, the, there was a couple of days before the before tip off where I'd reached out to the AFL representative who'd said to reach out if I have any questions. <laughs> and my question was, do I need to bring my own chair or? <laughs> Is there going to be a chair on field for me or? <laughs> and then? Turns out most people bring their own chair. Oh, okay. The chairs are for the, uh, for the trainers. Don't take the trainer's chair. They, uh, they need them. <laughs> All right. So you got a chair. Fuck yeah. Yeah. But the AFL, um, they were amazing. They were extremely welcoming and accommodating. 
um, because they do really understand the importance of um, the con contributions of Indigenous people to to the game of AFL. Um, I'm also really thankful that uh, Cozzy Pickett was playing in the final because if he wasn't there, there would not have been an Indigenous player. Oh, St Stephen May, sorry, is, is there as well. Um, but yeah, had Melbourne not made the final, I might not have had the opportunity to be able to mm. to photograph it. Um, so yeah, I've got I've got that to be thankful for. But yeah, in terms of of preparation, you you prepare as much as you can. Um, but I I often tell myself that I got this from Bryce Cotton. Um, in an interview where he talked about something which he calls the recess mindset. Um, and he applies it to his game of basketball, but before a game when you've got, you know, nerves coming, he tries to think about when he used to play basketball at school. And it's like you would just eat as quickly as you can and you go out and play. Then there was no nerves, there was no... You, you play because you know how to play basketball and that's the recess mindset. And I go out there and I shoot because I know how to shoot and that's that's my recess mindset. I love that, man. That's that's such a good such a good way to look at it. Um, it makes me reflect on it and think, yeah, I still get nervous from shoots. I've got to shoot after this, and I'm interviewing a whole bunch of random people for a client to make them look better. And it's a tripod set up, and I'm just like, and it's at it's at the in a loo uh, cinema. And before the, the screening, they're doing like a private screening. And I'm just like, is the lighting going to be good? Because I don't want to bring this big lighting thing, but I'm just like, shit, I should bring some lighting shit. Crap. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I'm taking an Uber there because I'm not driving at the moment. Not that I'm banned or anything. I just can't be fucked driving right now. And then I'm just like, whatever happens, happens. But when I get, I know when I get there, when I get there, it's just like cameras on, everything's ready, got my batteries, got my SD cards, you know, your two, your two things you, you need the most. Yeah. And yeah, go for it. On oh, the mics, because it's an interview. And yeah, I go on, reflecting back on what you just said, I'm like, yeah, the recess mindset, that is something that I do, that I actually do. So bounce down, you're starting to snap. What's that feel like, the first photograph? Um, it's, it's very different watching an AFL game through a tiny little viewfinder as opposed to watching it on the television. Um, and AFL is a fast game um, and I just tried to focus on taking the shots that I needed to take. I turned off the uh, preview because I almost didn't want to see my images because if I'm looking at my images... You're missing. I'm missing the action. Mm. I might have a look every now and then if there's a break in play to make sure, you know, my settings are okay, that I'm not taking <laughs> over or underexposed photos. Uh, but for the most part, I'm not looking at my photos throughout the game and... I'll, I'll wait until half time or wait until I'm looking through my photos. You know when you've got a, a winner. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, I learned this later that you can rate, you know, rate your photos in camera um, because when it comes to processing and you need to get them up, you know, within minutes of the play happening, you don't want to be going through all your photos. Um, but, yeah, the feeling, the atmosphere is indescribable from going, I think there was, what, 65,000 people there and going from moments where you can hear a pin drop to hearing the whole place erupt, um, hear, hearing what the players are saying on field, which is something you don't experience on the television. Um, and I did have to stop and sort of take a breath and stop shooting every now and then and just take in the atmosphere and remind myself where I was and, and what I was doing. Um, but I was so focused on taking the photos in those moments. It's almost like, it's almost like tunnel vision. Um, and I had to force myself out of that tunnel vision every now and then. Um, but I was just m making sure that 
I got as many photos as I could, as yeah. many good photos as I could. Smell the air, be mindful, and uh, yeah, enjoy it. How many profile pictures uh, of AFL players do you have now? Um, I remember the one Melbourne guy that you kept sharing. Number five? What's his name? Uh, Christian Petrarca. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Christian Petrarca took a liking to one of my photos and he put that as his uh, Instagram profile picture. Yeah. And it's still up there <laughs> today. Yeah. You know, over two years later as his Instagram profile picture. I reckon that'll be there for a while because that's grand final day picture. Yeah. That's, that's gold. He also, I saw him speak in a documentary uh, called Momentum, which was about their grand final win. Um, and he's talking about that moment, that, that photo I was taken, and he said that in that moment it's like the most in the moment he's ever felt. And you can see it in his eyes on the photos and he's looking directly at me when I, when I took that photo. And for me, that was also the moment that I felt the most in the moment in my life. And it's, it's really cool that Christian Petrarca and I get to share that, that yeah. moment together. Um, and... Not to, you know, discredit any of the AFL photographers who were there already because they're all really incredible at what they do. But to have Christian Petrarca, who was the best player on ground that day, to have chosen my photo uh, out of all the photos that were taken that day to, to represent him, I, th I think was really cool. You know, those people have been doing it for decades and I came out there with lesser equipment than everyone else, um, less experience than everyone else, but I think my drive and my my passion is what what got me there. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Bailey Fritch is another player. He kicked six goals that day, and I got a you know great photo of one of his goal celebrations, which is his Instagram profile picture. Um, and his fiance also reached out to me and asked to get a high quality print of it. So they've got a copy of that printed in their media room at home. Ooh, um, that's so cool. Yeah, that's sick. Yeah. So with with prints like that, do you do you just say, mate, that's it's all yours, here you go? Or do you do you do the professional thing and charge them as well? What do you what do you do in that scenario? Um, I'm I'm happy to give the photos away. Um, especially at those moments. I mean Christian Petrarca didn't ask, he just took it. <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't have I wouldn't have said no, because that that means so much to me yeah um it might be different once i've developed a bit of a name for myself but at that point i'm just a nobody yeah um and yeah it means a lot for for him to yeah. appreciate my work like that now i'll come back to the grand final but rem it reminds me of a time you and i had a chat about a uh, photograph that was going to be used in a certain store by a certain brand for a certain amount of time do you want to talk about that Absolutely. All right. Tell me about it. You can you can unveil it and then I'll ask some questions. So my – I love sports photography, um, but my favourite sport is basketball uh, deep down. And whenever people ask me how to get into sports photography, how did you get into AFL, how did you get into basketball photography – I tell them to reach out to your local players and your local groups. Um, I saw that uh, Summer Jam, which is a, a streetball tournament which started in Melbourne, where they were having the 10th one, they were having a, a version of it in Perth. Actually, I think I've got my um, oh, hey. my Summer Jam Jordan shirt nice. on at the moment. Um, I reached out to them on their Instagram and said, Hey, I you know would love to cover the event. I was covering for the Koori Mail newspaper, and I knew that there was an Indigenous team, uh, Bina, uh, that were playing there, and so I really wanted to make a story out of that. Um, so I reached out to them and asked if they'd be happy for me to cover that event, um, which they were. It turned out that Bina won the event, so that ended up being a great story for the Koori Mail newspaper. Um, they really appreciated my images, but there was also in the dunk contest, I took a really great photo of Johnny, uh, Johnny Latula, who uh, won the dunk competition and, yeah, took a great f photo of him dunking. Um, he's in the middle of a frame over the crowd. Um, you can see the judges' table. You can see everyone's faces. Um, everyone's holding out their phone because they're filming it. 
Uh, it's definitely a vibey photo. Also just so happens that the way his shirt or his jersey is, you can see the House of Hoops logo and the Nike logo. Um, he's also wearing Nike shoes and Nike socks, so the Nike logos are quite prominent. Yeah. Um, it was such a good photo that the Summer Jam team decided to use it as the main photo for their website and Oof. their promotion uh, for their materials. And I think that's how Nike and the Jordan brand um, saw my image. Um, and someone reached out to me uh, representing Nike and asked if I would be happy to sell them the rights to that photo to be used in Foot Locker stores. Oh, wow. So from you reaching out to a local team that ended up winning to taking a photo of a, an extra event with a dunk contest led you to being discovered by a Nike and Jordan brand. It, yeah. And I had to <sighs> um, sign a contract with Nike, which was quite an extensive uh, contract. You can imagine what a Nike I remember contract you, I remember you asking me about it. Looks I remember, like. Yeah, I remember talking um, about it. But they also said that as a part of signing that contract, I am now a subcontractor of Nike um, and it makes it much easier to do, you know, work for them in the future. Mm -hmm. um, they haven't reached out for any work yet, but um, I know that that time will surely come. Yeah, you're on their radar. If you're on their radar, you have a better chance. I'm on chance. the books. Yeah. So for people who are looking to get their first gig to then dreaming of something like Nike or Jordan brand, or, you know, working in – for shooting at the AFL Grand Final. How do your negotiations change between your first gig and an opportunity like Nike? Um, yeah, they, they, they change a lot. So I went from happily giving away my photos for free to being put in a position where I had to negotiate. They put the ball in my court as to how much of course. I wanted to sell the rights to that photo for. Yep. I had no idea where to get that figure from. Um, luckily, I reached out to, you know, the, the contacts, my network, um, got the best advice I could. I was throwing quite a, a high number <laughs> to, to throw out there. Um, you know, more than 50 times more than I'd ever been paid for a photo <laughs> before. Um, and I was a little bit cheeky and I threw a little bit more on top of that number um, and they accepted it without any question. Do you um, know what that means? What does that mean? It means you could have got more. It means I, it means I could have got more. Um, but that you're, I think you're always going to have that, um, that battle. Yeah. I also didn't want to price myself out of something which was a great opportunity 100%. for me. Um, but at the same time, it also taught me the, the value of, of my work. 100%. Um, I, part of the advice that I got was, you have to think about how much it would cost Nike to be able to recreate that photo if they wanted to. And it's something that they could not recreate. That was a genuine grassroots basketball moment. And I think if a corporation wants to commodify a genuine grassroots basketball moment, they need to pay for it. Yeah. Because they, they can try and recreate that all they can, but they can't. Yeah, there's no genuine, authentic, real story behind it. And that's the real value. Absolutely. That's the real value. Um, with that, I'm going to add on to this for anybody listening. The more of these you get, the more sample size you have to get a better figure of what you're worth. And then once you create a pipeline, which means how many bookings you have in advance or how many bookings on average you get, it's a math equation – you will then be able to confidently say this much for my photo or my images or my work and have a with or without you attitude. It comes after a lot of experience but a lot, also a lot of successful deals because the leverage is built. 
you now have leverage that warrants that 50 times your usual amount, which is the fun part in the business side of shit, which a lot of people, a lot of artists don't realize. When I discovered it with wedding photography, I was charging 1900 for a day, 2500 for like the ultimate package. But I was booked out for six months with those packages and I could survive off of those six months and not do anything else. I can delete all my socials and just get by for six months. And I had a business coach at the time, shout outs to Kieran. He said to me, you got six months of work, double your rates. And I was like, shit, double my rates? Yeah. And I'm like, what extra value do I put into the packages? He's like, nothing. Just double your rates because you're in demand. You can, you, if they say yes, what's the problem? I'm like, true. And I'm like, but what if they say no? He goes, you got six months to figure out how to convince them to say yes. Within four weeks, I got 10 new bookings at double my rates. That would have been 20 weddings. Then I said to him, I'm booked out for 12 week, uh, months now. What do I do? He goes, double it. I'm like, bro, that's 10 grand for like the ultimate package. He's like, what'd you do before and what happened? I'm like, stuff it. Within four weeks, I got two bookings, 10 grand each. That would have been like eight weddings at yeah. my usual rate six months ago. Yeah. But that was experience, sales, leverage built over time. And I'm excited for you because now the next and, journey. And I mean, also because of that, like you, you might say, what's the value mm. to the client? Mm. And they might say nothing. But if you're doing two jobs as opposed to six or eight, you're doing a better job on those two Focus. Sorry for the interruption, but this show would not be possible without the help of Bright Tank Brewery. They are the major sponsor of the Sevo Show. Huge shout outs to them. Check them out. Great beers, great people, great everything. And uh, well, let's get back to the episode. Extra focus. And that's 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 worth it. Yeah. If you can if you can deliver the product, that's worth that's it. That's right. I don't I'm not gatekeeping here and I'm not shitting on photographers who want to work hard and want to do two weddings on a weekend. But I'm also educating the couples and the photographers saying, do you want your wedding photographer who has smashed out a wedding the day before, do you think their energy levels will be as high as the couple before you? The Most of the time, the answer is going to be no. Unless they're a freak, then No. And yeah, we go down a rabbit hole with that. But back to you and your story with your Nike deal, that went ahead and that was, did you see it in person or post it up and stuff? Funnily enough, <laughs> they, they paid for it and they still haven't put the image okay. up in, in any Foot Locker stores. I've been in a number of times <laughs> um, and asked about it and they never put it up, which was Kind of a little bit disappointing because I really wanted to see it yeah, up in the store. They did end up using it in a magazine which went out as a promotional material for Summer Jam and the centre was a lift-out poster cool. which ended up being my poster um, and, you know, it had the Jordan and Nike branding on it and so that was really cool to see. Man, that could be on someone's wall, some kid's wall, who's either an avid basketball fan or a photography fan yeah yeah people have sent me pictures of it of it on people's walls receipts love those um, receipts so yeah that's that's really cool to see yeah um going back to the money the money thing it's i'm i'm not a person who's motivated by money um you know we need money to survive and obviously in the situation you're in you've got overheads you've got to pay being an artist in itself is is a privilege um i'm not motivated by money and i think that works to my benefit like i'm i'm motivated by my goals um i really want to pursue sports photography for the rest of my life i want to pursue basketball photography for the rest of my life i would love to make it to the nba i would love to make it to the olympics that's what i am motivated by in life I understand that money is a result of of hard work. The byproduct is, is money is the byproduct of s success. 
Yeah. Um, and money should not be the motivator. I think success should be the motivator. So I've had, you know, I'm booking some jobs at the moment. I've got some jobs coming up. I've got two jobs which are about the same amount of work. One of them is paying $400. The other one's paying $10,000. Um, and I'm happy to do both of them because they both align with my goals. Um, and I obviously happy to take the, the higher money. I'm, I'm happy to take the less money as well because I, I see it as helping someone out. And once again, I never know when that connection is going to help me out in, in the future. Do you ever think about those two contrasting numbers, the fees, and them, them finding out that you've you know, quoted someone significantly less? by maybe watching this podcast and going, hey, what the fuck? Well, no, no, um, because, look, I say that they're the same amount of work, but they, I will be delivering two very different products. Yep. One of them is just a standard photography job. The other one will require a team mm -hmm. that I'll have to put together. So I have to employ the team. Um, it requires a lot more gear. Um, so they are, they are different jobs. Um, the point I was trying to make is that I'm happy to do both of those jobs yeah. because it's not all about money. I guess I'm, I'm lucky that I have the freedom to be able to do those things. Um, I understand, yeah. But, you know, I, I see myself when I, when I am at the Olympics and when I am in the NBA, I will be selling my photos for more money. So you didn't quite make it to Paris 2024. 2028, no. where are we at? L.A., 2032 is different though. Where's 2032? That's uh, home soil. Yeah. That'll be in Brisbane. Yeah. So I'll be very surprised if I'm not at the uh, Brisbane Olympics. In I won't be surprised. I'll be disappointed. <laughs> oh, yeah, look, I'll be disappointed as well. I'm a little disappointed that I'm not in Paris at the moment. I'm mm -hmm. seeing some incredible photos yeah. coming out of Paris. Um, yeah, one of my guys is there at the moment, Jordan Kahu. He used to play in the NRL. Um, okay. He's a Sony head like me, and he got the gig to follow Paddy Mills around. Awesome. Something that really would be right up your alley, you know, Absolutely. being Indigenous. Um, but I'm getting some, some cool inside, inside uh, stories from Jordan at the moment. And, dude, like, it's so achievable for you. And LA, like, far out. Can you imagine the basketball scene? Yeah. Yeah, I, re I really want to be in... LA as well so that's that's four years away um, I I think one of the reasons that I'm not in Paris at the moment was because I was uh, locked down to a, a full-time job yeah um, and they yeah they weren't covering the Olympics mm -hmm. um, but yeah now now that I'm free uh, I can get a bit back closer towards my goals and I love this bell curve that we're unfolding here for everybody listening back to the grand final that's finished. You have your photos. You've done a great job. That wasn't your first and last AFL game, was it? No. So that was that was my first official AFL game. But then I ended up covering the entire next season for the Koori Mail newspaper. Nice. So I was at every West Coast Eagles and Dockers home game. Nice. For the 2022 season. Amazing. Yeah. That's fucking sick. Yeah. That's so cool. I, um, did you have like a, a standard fee for that sort of event or did Crew Mail pay you an hourly rate? Um, so I was working freelance yep. for them. Um, they would get me the media pass, which, which would get me to the events, but I would get paid per photo that they would use. Oh my God. Um, I would also do some writing, um, so I'd get paid for articles as well. Um, but I guess it wasn't it it wasn't guaranteed yeah. for me. The income wasn't guaranteed, but generally they would want to use a photo from that week of of the indigenous. That's players. the life. That's the life of a freelancer. There, you never know. Yeah, but if you can create a pipeline and like an agreement of X amount, and that's the hard part about photography. Actually, that's why wedding photography is a little bit easier to to go into because you've got your deposit and then you've got your guaranteed money closer to the date. But doing it on a job-to-job -job basis when you're not full-time for a newspaper, for example, 
it gets like when are you when you get your next meal sort of thing, right? But if you're doing it for the success, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't really matter. Uh, especially if you're good at saving, you're good with money um, on the back end. And that's what I tell artists all the time. I'm like, when you do get paid, don't eat all at once. Put some money aside. You're going to have your your quiet times. Have you had your quiet times? Yeah. What are they like? Um, it, can be, it can be stressful. Um, you know, if, you, if you're not sure how much longer you're going to be able to pay your rent for, that's a stressful situation to be in. Um, and it's, as a creative, it's hard to be creative when you're under stress. Um, how do you deal with that? How do you get through that? Um, self-care. I think self-care is really important. Um, knowing, knowing what things help you. So like I have a bit of a routine that I stick to. Um, even when I don't have work coming in, I've got my routine that I'm that I'm going through. So it's, I'm still going through the motions, and I'm still I'm still doing something. Um, taking walks is an important part of that routine. Listening to podcasts is an important part of that routine. Um, yeah, re- rewarding myself in in healthy ways. You're continuing to turn up for yourself. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So besides the Tom Hawkins incident. Tell us about that quickly. Um, Cut out myself. A little bit of a funny story. <laughs> I I told my girlfriend once that I follow a page on Instagram, No Context AFL, where they just post <laughs> funny incidents that have happened on the on the TV uh, during the AFL games, and I told her that I've always had this like nightmare that I'm going to end up on no context AFL and she's like why would you ever end up on there and I'm like I don't know like someone might throw a pie at me in the crowd like sometimes you do show up as on the television as a photographer and I know whenever I've showed up on the TV because I start to get messages on my phone I'll get five or six in a row being like oh you're on TV yeah um and yeah you never know if something embarrassing might happen, you know, there's been days when it's been raining and I've had to have a poncho on and it's really windy. It's like, what if my poncho flies off and like hits a player or something oh like dear. that? Yeah. Um, anyway, Tom Hawkins is lining up for a goal right in front of me, uh, sort of bending over. He has his ass right in my face. I, I'm kind of like looking away because I know that I'm on the screen and his ass is in my face. But there was just one frame where I must have just like glanced and the frame was caught and posted on <laughs> No Context AFL. Uh, me looking directly into the eye of uh, Tom Hawkins. <laughs> oh, my God. His, his back eye. Uh, your notifications must have blown up that day. Funnily enough, that's not the most embarrassing thing that's happened oh. during a game. Okay. Uh, during an AFL game, I managed to trip over a referee. <laughs> a boundary umpire? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, by accident, he – look, it was his fault. I'm in my spot. He came a little bit too close, wasn't looking where he was going, but he, like, tripped over, hurt himself. They had to stop the game. <laughs> uh, not for very long, but, like, they stopped the clock. Um, you can hear Andrew Gaze talking about it. Uh, luckily, Gaze had my back and he blamed the ref for not watching where he was going. <laughs> Gaze, shout outs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Got to watch out for What the, the ref say? Is he just like, I'm a bad or? He, he seemed, he seemed pretty pissed off about it. Uh, but he, he did genuinely seemed hurt. He like kind of stepped on my foot and looked like he twisted his ankle a little bit. But oh, he was shit. able to play through the rest of the game like a champion. And but he didn't like say to you going, mate, you're in the wrong. No, oh, he didn't. He wouldn't even look at me. <laughs> and you could have cost his... Man, refer like I used to train um, with umpires. Um, back when I was in the country countryside, when I lived in Kalgoorlie, and one of the umpires there, um, he, used to, he used to umpire AFL and he would tell us how it all works and shit. 
and then yeah they have their own kind of little brownlow votes system thing but uh their votes uh are really more for best performing get the ga- the finals and the grand final gig and i was like oh that's pretty cool now i don't know if that's true or not or if if i'm like paraphrasing or i'm either uh, if it was just like a country thing but i was like that makes sense but man mm. they get they get a bit bitchy to, yeah. within within themselves they're like fuck I'm still a boundary umpire damn it <laughs> <laughs> i'm a goal umpire Ugh. <laughs> in country level like goal umpires are like 60 with dementia and boundary umpires are kids coming up from cults <laughs> and field umpires are the ones that actually get paid yeah. but some of my greatest memories are actually like coming up as a teenager and doing boundary umpiring for all three grades and getting 50 bucks for each grade yeah and like i was the fittest little kid like by the end of the league i was like Fuck yeah, 150 bucks, how good is this? And then well, someone in the fucking scoreboard is getting the same money as me just doing keeping the sport scoreboard. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> if, you're, if you're young yeah. um, and you're, you want to get in, you know, to get yourself into the sporting clubs, there's so many jobs around. I didn't realise until I started taking photos, but from the, you know, the, the ball kids who, you know, hand out the balls and wipe off the sweat to mm. the people who are keeping scores, to the people who are selling tickets to the games, that there are so many jobs available. And I think if you're a young person and you're too young to, you know, be taking photos on the sidelines, why not get yourself, you know, into one of those other roles? Because that's where you can start networking and making those connections. If it's sport that you want to pursue. If it's something else that you want to pursue like music, you can you can apply those things. That's great advice, man. That's great advice. Now, you finished your 2022 season in AFL. Then you got into something that was more interesting for you. What did you do next? Um, so, yeah, basketball is, is really my passion. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I also covered the, been covering the Perth Wildcats. Um, so that's the, the NBL? Yeah, the yep. NBL yep. for yeah three three seasons. Nice. So you were doing that simultaneously. Yes. Whew, that's sick. All yeah. right. All right. And what was your highlight for the NBL? Um, look, I think every game is a is a highlight for me. Like it's always been a dream of mine from when I was really little watching basketball games. You know, one day I want to be courtside at a at a basketball game. Of course. And now not. I'm not courtside, I'm on the court. I'm sitting on the court or I'm sitting underneath the basket. Um, you know, I have players fall on me. I have to catch the ball and, and throw protect it Protect your in. lens. Yeah. yeah, protect my lens. <laughs> um, yeah, it's – I. It, yeah, every game is a highlight. There's – basketball is a great sport in that, you know, it often comes down to the final play and the final moments. Um in the seasons that I've been covering the Wildcats, unfortunately, I still haven't been able to cover a playoff game yet, either because they've just been knocked out early or I wasn't there to cover it. Um, but even those games, you know, came down to the final moments of those games and and being able to freeze those moments and capture that that mo- nice. moments of elation or those moments of uh, disappointment, yeah. I think, is really special. Now, after all of this. What came next? You got a full-time job somewhere. Uh, yes. So I, being a photographer, I'm always doing freelance stuff, but you you always want something a little bit more stable. Um, so I have my LinkedIn job alerts set to let me know whenever a fo- photography position shows up anywhere in Australia. It's not very often that jobs show up or ones that are paying enough um but i eventually saw a job pop up uh for a full-time photography position at seven west media um and i applied for that position apparently i was one of 160 applicants nice um they got it down to 10 interviews and then i was the person who ended up getting that that full-time photography role. Fuck yeah. Um, yeah, which I was proud of. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, got a lot of 
experience yeah. out of out of that role working for the the newspaper. Mm -hmm. and when you were when you were doing that, uh, when you started off, I remember that's when I first reached out for the podcast stuff, and I was like, "Yes, he's on that next level." Did it feel like the next level day one? Uh, yeah, it it did. I went from being really confident in my abilities. Like I I didn't think I was the, the shit. I knew I was the shit. <laughs> I guess I was riding off a bit of a, a high. I'd um, achieved a lot in a really short amount of time. Um, and yeah, I thought I was I thought I was top dog. Um, when joining the newspaper, most of the people have been in that job for decades um, and I, I was really going from considering myself to being a professional to being an absolute beginner again. Um, and it's, it's always a humbling experience. I went from clients always being super happy with my work to receiving a lot of criticism on my work, which I thought was really good. Um, but yeah, newspapers have specific standards. Um, they all of the ways quite set in their ways, and I it was a learning curve for me. Absolutely. How does that feel as a creator going from creating as a passion to then, you know, needing to get something more permanent, more stable, and then because of that trade off in this world we live in, creatively freelance you're now having to keep that job because – and to keep that job, you have to abide by their rules, creative rules. What's the contrast in before and during that? Um, yeah, so it's very different. I know what I think makes a really good photo, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's no longer about what I think makes a really good photo – it's now what the editor thinks is a good photo. We might have differing opinions. Art is subjective. Um, but, yeah, you're, you're having to a, a, apply to someone else's subjectivity rather than your own. So I think there, really, there needs to be a really strong feedback loop. Yeah. You know, Does so it have that? Um, not, maybe not as much as I would have liked or expected. Um, there was lots of telling me what they didn't want. Not a lot of what, telling me what I, what they do want. Um, and yeah, that, that, that was a bit difficult for me. Do you feel like it, it was like a guessing game most of the time? Yeah. A lot of the time it was a guessing game. Yeah. Trial and error. Um, error sucks. Of course. And especially if you learn from the error and then you come up with a different error but they're not telling you. And this is just not this, cl this client or this job but I go through this all the time. I go through a preliminary meeting with clients and say, hey, here's a sample of what we've done. Do you like it? Yes, no. They're like, yep, sick. I can go forward and just b batch it, send it to them. They're like, oh, this isn't what we wanted. And I'm like, this is exactly what the preview looked like, right? Had one um, a few months ago. They said they don't like the color of the fonts of the videos. And it's a brand person coming in that works for the, the client. But the client approved it, which meant that I batched everything. And then they said... This new brand person said, hey, don't like the colours. I'm like, well, it was approved by your boss. So going back and re-editing all this, there's going to be a fee. Would you want to explain that to them or do you want me to just go forward with it and change it and invoice you? And they're like, oh, no, 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 keep it as it is if they approved it. I'm like, good. It's different in your world, especially in this world. But how, how do you get through that knowing that you're no longer – doing it for a passion but you're pretty much performing for someone else as a creator 
how do you feel? Um, look, it's, it's different. So once again, I'm not choosing the stuff that I cover. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's chosen for me. Yeah, you put on assignment. The, um, the nature of news is you can't predict what's going to happen in the world. Mm-hmm. So I would literally find out what job I was doing. At, like I would find out about the job as it came through. Yeah. So there was very little in the way of preparation. I mean, every now and then there was, but I got, like there was an instance where I got sent to a, a job which was uh, on an offshore gas rig. Wow. Um, Did you get to fly a helicopter? No, but we uh, took, took a plane out there. No, no helicopters, but we did get to go up on the... Um, on the Helipad? On the, I don't know, the plant, the, yeah. the rig. Um, the brief that I got before going was very basic. We just need some standard shots of, you know, this and that. Spent the entire day there. You know, it was a 12-hour day. Had to fly there, fly back. Um, after I got back, delivered, I get a phone call saying, where's this photo? Where's this photo? Where's this photo? Really specific shot list. But I was like, well, this is what I was asked and this is what I took photos of. Um, and I even said I would really appreciate that, you know, if you've got a specific shot list, I'd appreciate that before going on the trip rather than when I get back. <laughs> Classic. Um, which I think, you know, is, is fair enough. Um, but but you're right. It's about having those expectations agreed upon beforehand. Beforehand, and that's where that's what I'm teaching my creators um, that are working with me. I'm saying, let's create a shot list. I'll give you the ball. I'll give you the. I'll put it in your court. You're going to create the shot list, and I'm going to tell you if that's good or not before the shoot is done. Because once the shoot's happened, the moment's happened. Yeah, you kind of can't go back, especially if it's in like a news thing. So I think there's clients or jobs that we have out there that feel like a step up the next level, but a lot of them have outdated systems. And a lot of the time we can't do anything about it because we're coming in as rookies. And as creators, we have our own subjective personal ways and styles that we want to do it that we think would look good on paper or on print or on digital or whatever on the TV. And then someone else who's been in there forever, they just run through the standard stuff and it's frustrating. So you've since left. We won't go into what happened there um, because, you know, like you said before, there's no point in, um, you know, talking about uh, things because they may bite you in the ass and then also keeping it on a good note maybe. Um What's next for you after this job? What's the go? You've got two gigs, so you've got a couple of dollars coming in. Yeah. What's your plan? What's your next move? Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to get back to working on the stuff that realigns with my goals, which is I really want to make it to the NBA, the Olympics, or the FIBA World Cup, the Basketball World Cup. I'm, I'm really passionate about basketball. Um, so I'll, I'll be covering the NBL season uh, for the Curry Mail again. Hey, cool. Um, really happy to be back on the basketball court. Um, I've, what I really wanted to get out of my role was a stable income, so save up some money so I could upgrade my gear. Um, I really wanted to get as much experience out of that role as I could. Um, a lot of what I was doing was taking portraits. Um, posed portrait photography is not my passion, but it's even if you're a sports photographer, you have to, you know, take team photos. You have to take um, portrait photography is a big, big part of that. So I learned a lot of skills when it came to port- portrait photography. I Got as much out of like as I could out of that role. Um, being able to save up a bit of money 
So I've earned myself some, some freedom over the next few months. I'm going to use that freedom to, yeah, throw myself back into the things that I love doing. Um, I know that not if, when I do well, money will start rolling in. I th I'm confident that I'll be able to make more money going back to freelance than I was making in my full-time role. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm on to much bigger and better things. I think you are, absolutely, 100%. Now, what is your top piece of advice you'd give to someone who is your rookie self? Um, I think... People know when they're not getting fulfillment mm -hmm. out of life. Um, and I knew when I wasn't getting fulfillment out of my life. Um, but now I'm in a place where I'm, I'm really lucky and blessed in that my job, my goals and my passions are all one in the same. Um, and I really think that's what a fulfilling life is about. Um, yeah, trying to get your – all of those things aligned into one. It's a really hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. A, you have to know what you want to do. Um, B, you have to work really hard to get there. Um, like I see being an artist as a privilege. Um, I didn't grow up as a, as a rich person. I had to work really hard to afford myself the the freedom to be able to do do what I do. Um, but I guess my advice is find out what it is that you want to do and and start doing it. Start small. Start anywhere because once once those three things align, it becomes automatic. Yeah. And you can I can't turn off. I I'm always. Um, thinking about what my goals and I, I know that they're achievable because mm -hmm. I know I've set really high goals and achieved them before. Um, and then th the most exciting thing about when you set impossible goals is when you achieve them, you then have to find new impossible goals to set. Love that. But you have to start somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. You got, you got to, you got to actually take the first step. Yeah. Have you ever experienced burnout? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, especially when I was juggling my passion and my, my full-time role, um, I reached, reached a point of burnout um, where I – it took me a while to recover from, um, you know, a, a couple of months even of, like I said, focusing on myself and that, and that process – um, because yeah, it's when you, when you are so focused and determined on your goals, it's really easy to get caught up in just one more thing, just one more hour, just, and it's easy to burn yourself out, which is why I think that that structure is important for me anyway. Um, for anyone, for anyone, for anyone, for anyone. I love it. I've got a couple of more questions for you. These are fast ones. So yep. answer them, get, get through them. It's the, the fast pace part. As a photographer, as a creative, what's one subscription you don't want to live without? Subscription? Like service? For me, it's my Adobe Creative Suite subscription. That was if the I, first one that came to mind for me. There you go. There you go. Um, but I'd rather not have to pay for it, Adobe. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> I did something with them, but I just... I just chose the money instead of the free subscription. That's <laughs> better. Sorry. What do you enjoy most about being an entrepreneur? Um, <laughs> uh, the freedom of being in control of your life. And what's the hardest part? The freedom. <laughs> 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 I understand that completely. Um, how do you build a successful customer base? Um. I think alluding to what I was saying earlier about making connections, um, like my customer base, I don't see them as customers. It's genuine friendships. 
Nice. What do you think your unique skills that help you become successful? Just one, one big skill apart from the fact that you can take good photos. Um, I think it's my, my drive, my, like, my hyper-focus, which can also be of detriment, mm -hmm. but I, that's my superpower. What have you learned from the most successful person you know? Um, so I measure success um, not by money or by commercial success. Um, a, favor, a saying I like is if, you, if that's the way that you measure success, then you agree that a Big Mac is the best burger in the world and we all know that that's not true. <laughs> um, so I really look up to uh, Matsu photos, Daniel Craig, a really close friend of mine who's moved to Japan onto bigger and better things. But he taught me that anything is possible. I love that. What is your favourite book? Um, I don't read a lot of books. I, I do read a lot, um, but not a lot of books. I, I recently read, uh, it was the early works of Stanley Kubrick when, from when he was a photographer, photographic journalist. Perfect answer. If you, if you could take a class to learn anything, what would it be? Philosophy. Oh, I'm, into, I'm into philosophy. That's the best answer I've gotten so far. That's like, and then like my follow-up would be, like my guarantee is at the end of the class you'd know all about it. That's a great answer. All right, that's good. I don't think someone can trump that. Um, what distracts you the most every day? Um, it's funny, my distraction is my passion. So basketball, if there's a game of basketball on, I find it hard to do <laughs> anything. Who's your team? Funnily enough, I don't have a team. I think because I'm not from America, I don't have an affiliation. I tend to follow players. I think Giannis is my, my favourite player. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's lots of great players out there. Nice. Paddy Mills. Yeah, Paddy Mills is up there. I'm, uh, I'm uh, on the Wemby train. Yep. Huge fan of Big him. Wemby Nyama. Um, the Alex, the Alexander Saar. Yes. From the Wildcats. I do think that LeBron is the GOAT now. LeBron have, is LeBron. I have converted, but also the debate in the era, all of that stuff, it's a different ball game now. I'm so excited to see him play with his son. Yeah. So excited. Yeah. Bronny's exactly. starting to stat up a little bit um, in the summer league and obviously um, – the big yeah, he's man, been hit, the been big man. Some threes. Yeah, the exhibition games uh, in, in at Paris at the moment. Like, uh, they're all talking about how Sudan nearly won the other night. The night, and I'm like, they're just warming up, man. They're just playing. Yeah, they do. They've got a super team together. They do. And I find it hard to see anyone beating them. Yeah. But they do have to step up their game from these exhibition games. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure they will. But anything can happen. Basketball is quickly becoming a world sport. Love it. You know, you've got Luka Doncic, Giannis, Embiid. Some of the best players are yep. non-Americans. Joker. Yeah. Joker. Yeah. I love How it. Can you forget? Yeah, absolutely. And Wemby's is he French? Wemby's French. Yeah, Wemby's French. Um, yeah, I'm excited to see what happens next. And yeah, totally stoked. I, I I'm the biggest fan of this father son thing. I cannot. I am excited about the media just covering that and everyone complaining about it yes there are other players in the league but when will you see this happen again my, fa my favorite comment on socials is bro made his own fucking team teammate <laughs> <laughs> i can't wait to hear him say uh daddy pass i'm open <laughs> <laughs> all right final section on the show yes the phone's ringing you gotta pick it up you gotta pretend like you're talking to him that person is you yeah. just after the Brisbane Olympics. And that person, as we're manifesting here, you, yep. 2032, has done it. Yeah. He's about to talk to you on the phone. What are you going to talk to him about? It's Halim. How are you? How'd you go, mate? <laughs> you went well. I knew it. I'd expect nothing less. Um. Yeah, can't wait to see your images. Glad to hear you've done well in life. What are you asking uh, him, though, about it? What was your favourite 
What was your favourite moment? Um, and what do you think you would say to that? I guess it's hard to know. It's hard to know. Um, LeBron and Bronny going lay up back to back. <laughs> yeah, LeBron's still playing. <laughs> 48 years old. <laughs> LeBron's still going. Oh, perfect. Thanks for coming in, man. Thanks for having me. And thank you for sharing your bell curve of a career that is not an upwards-downwards inflection but a downwards-upwards reflection. And it's always on a positive path. It's never linear. Never no. linear. It's always an up and down, but I'm glad that you, as a creator, reflecting back, looking back, and most importantly, learning from your moments. And as I've forgotten to turn off the curtains, sorry, shut the curtains, for those of you that have been viewing this, the whole episode, I apologize for the light changing back and forth, back and forth. I'm in the studio producing this myself. Everyone's out of office today. Uh, Halim, thank you so much for your time. How do we find your work? Uh, most of my work is on Instagram, uh, Hal Photos, H-A-L-F-O-T-O-S. Um, website will be back up and running soon, halphotos.com. Um, and uh, also be doing a lot of work with uh, the Kaya Media, Kaya Studios moving forward. Um, check out the Kaya podcast on Instagram. And uh, yeah, big, big things coming our way. Nice, nice. Um, actually, one final question. Um, what's one celebrity, if they could, if they booked you, if you could be booked by them as their full-time photographer, who would it be? And would you do it? Um, I'd, I'd have to say Paddy Mills. He, like, as an Indigenous Australian, but as an athlete, as a human being, as a basketballer, he, I think, embodies everything I, I love about all of those things. Uh, I have I met him once before and I, I told him that I'd be meeting him again one day soon and we took a photo together and I can't wait to share that, that next photo that we get together. My guy's with him in Paris. I got to connect. There you go. Let's do it. Let's there make it go. happen. There you go. <laughs> Gold right, guys. only. Give him, a, uh, give him a shout out. Give him a look in. Link in description. As always, good thanks. <laughs> <laughs>